Praise the Lord. Well, last week, um, I wanted to speak to you really about the climate change cult. And I called it a cult for the simple reason that a cult is defined as a system of religious veneration and devotion directed towards a particular figure or an object. And of course, this fixation on climate change has become uh, something of a religion deluding the good and the great all around the world. We looked last week how we're bombarded with it in the media being drip fed day after day. And we heard then of COP26, which is the 26th session of the Conference of Parties. And they were gathered together in spite of using all their private jets and the diesel guzzling limousines and arriving 25,000 people of them. And uh, of course, the sad thing was they were giving this doomsday prophecy that the world is ending, we're causing the ending of the world. And yet the whole point of the conference was what they were saying, they were saying that they, or you know, the we at the conference, are going to be the saviors of the world. And sadly, um, the majority, whilst it's there are some sensible things that can be said at these conferences, nevertheless, the majority of it is nonsense. And when you hear all these pledges of being net zero by such and such a date to carbon emissions and all of these things. And when you consider that it was only in the 1970s they were trying to tell us the earth was getting cooler and now they're telling us it's getting hotter. And, uh, but you know, friends, we need as Christians to know what the Bible says. The Bible is the inspired word of God and all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And uh, it's very easy, even for Christians, to run away with these things. Uh, I told you, I've already been invited to a Save the Planet service, where we can all go to pray that we'll save the planet. And uh, David Attenborough, whilst he might have produced some very good nature programs over the years, I'm not saying that, but nevertheless, is a famous e evolutionist and well lauded by the world and um, came out with statements that uh, it's catastrophic what's happening and if there's no action taken. Greta Thunberg, which to some might seem a petulant child, came out with this. This is the biggest crisis humanity has ever faced and together and united, we are unstoppable. And I had to remind you last week, this is far from the greatest crisis the world has ever faced. Sin is the greatest crisis the world has ever faced. And uh, they can stand together all the like, but human beings are not unstoppable. You only have to read Psalm 2, of course, to find that out. Because when all the leaders of the world come together and want to cast off the bonds or the shackles of God's laws, they put it, the word of God said that he sits in the heavens and shall laugh and have them in derision. And, uh, of course, then we had that statement of Boris Johnson, daily, weekly, we're doing such irreversible damage that long before a million years are up, we will have made this beautiful planet effectively uninhabitable, not just for us, but many other species. And whilst I don't, I do agree with him that the world won't look the same in a million years as it does now, I'm pretty sure of that. But you know, friends, the word of God told us in Romans 8.22, for we know, that's as godly people, we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together 
until now. Not only that, but also we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves because we're waiting for something. But friends, what we're waiting for and what this old earth is waiting for is the coming of the Lord. And, uh, and when the world will be destroyed eventually and God will make a new heaven and a new earth. But nonetheless, you may have been asking, what's the point of going into a subject like this and spending time dealing with it? Because friends, we need to know what we believe. Because, friends, when you read the newspapers and you watch the television, and as I've said to you, you're being drip-fed, I've heard Christians, not here, but Christians say, isn't it terrible how the world's going to end with all this climate change? And you remind them that the world's not going to end with climate change when Jesus comes again. But... But they say, well, I know, I'd forgotten, but, you know, something could happen if we don't do something about it now. And they've been soaked with these ideas. So we have to say, what does the Lord have to say on this matter? Aren't you glad that there's an answer in the word of God to all these situations? As I said to you, one preacher once talking about the green lobby and that sort of liberal agenda said... They're heretical, they're hysterical, and they're hypocritical. And, of course, they are hysterical, especially when you watch the Extinction Rebellion and insulate Britain, gluing themselves to the road to stop traffic. And it's madness and hypocritical, because I say it doesn't go unnoticed, and it didn't go unnoticed in the press when all those different private jets and cavalcades and limousines started arriving in Glasgow. None of it went unnoticed. Well, I said to you last week, I've got five points in this Bible study to deal with. And they are as follows. The origin of the earth, and we looked at that last week, the sustaining of the earth, the sin problem of the earth, the stewardship of the earth, and then the destruction of the earth. And last week, we spent a lot of time, an awful lot of time, in Genesis chapter 1. And, you know, friends, I've got to say this, it's important because over 31 times, and remember, only God was there at the time, but over 31 times we read of things that either God did, or God said, or God created, or God saw, or God divided, or God blessed. And we went through all those verses in Genesis chapter 1, and God made. And we said, you know, you can't be in any possible doubt that God is the creator of all these things. And yet, the very people who are telling us what the world's going to be like and what it's going to become are the very people who haven't a clue what the origin of the earth is like. And if you've got your foundations wrong, then anything that you build on it is wrong. Just like we are in this beautiful building tonight. You know, if they hadn't got good foundations, it would have collapsed. And uh, it's true to say that we... It's an absolute lie, friends. And, you know, this evolutionist idea and agenda that they're teaching your kids and your grandkids in schools as though it's factual and as though it's normal. But, friends, uh, we've got to see what the Lord says. So we looked at quite a lot about that, and we looked in Psalm 24 as well. About And we looked in Isaiah chapter 40 at several verses about the origin of the earth, because that's the first major issue, the foundational principle that these so-called scientists have got absolutely wrong. Now, I know there are some, some Christians or so-called Christians that try to play science alongside the Bible, and they try to put 
you know, oh, well, the laws of physics say this and they contradict somebody else and somebody else contradicts somebody else and they try to put all the laws. Friends, they're on a dangerous wicket. Why can't we just accept what God says? Scripture is God-breathed. And it's given of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we, we had a look, and then we looked at 2 Timothy 3, how God had said that in the last days, perilous times would come. But particularly at verse 7, when we found that these people were always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, the origin of the earth. And then we looked at the sustaining on the earth. And I want to tell you, friends, we had to do this because, you know, the Lord is in control of the earth. The Lord is in control of the climate as well. And nothing runs out of his control. And we looked at Colossians 1 verses 15 to 17, and we saw that how he upholds all things, and in him all things consist. And I reminded us that we only breathe because in and breathe out because God is sustaining us as the people of God. We looked at why the sun rises in the morning and it sets in the evening. The tide comes in and the tide goes out any day. We looked at the fact that if we were any closer to the sun, we would burn. If we were any further away from the sun, we would freeze. And, you know, to think that the earth travels uh, round the sun and all this uh, at a certain speed, friends, we're in the perfect location because God keeps us in that location. And we looked at a number of verses. We looked at how in Genesis chapter 8, after the flood stopped flooding, and we saw that Noah uh, made an offering to the Lord in Genesis chapter 8. And we'll come back to that scripture in a little while tonight. But uh, Noah built a, an altar to the Lord, and God said, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will again I destroy every living thing as I have done. And yet they're trying to tell us that if all these ice caps melt, the whole earth's going to get flooded again. Friends, it ain't. Not at all. Because God has promised that he will never flood the whole earth again. And God said this, while the earth remains. Now we'll come back to that scripture tonight a little later on. But while the earth remains... Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. Friends, as long as God wants the earth to remain, you're quite safe as the people of God. In that sense, as far as God looking after it, God sustaining the earth. You know, friends... We will, Boris Johnson said, if we continue the way we are going, the earth will warm up, the ice will melt, the waters will rise, and we'll be flooded out right round the globe. That was his words. It's nonsense. No matter what the scientists tell you or politicians saying to you, you know, the Lord says, as long as the creation remaineth, there will always be day and night, cold and heat. You know, friends, we don't have to worry. The Lord is sustaining. We looked at a verse in Hebrews when we read Hebrews 1 to 3. And how like men like to fret about things that they can't control. But you know they can't control them because God is in control. And we went into quite a bit more detail about the sustaining of the earth. But I did say to you that there is an issue and there is something that needs to be dealt with. And this is the third point in the study, and that is this, the sin problem on the earth. Let's have a look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 17.
We'll start at verse 16, Genesis chapter 2. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now, if you turn to chapter 3, the serpent was talking to the woman. And in verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Friends, that is the turning point. That is what caused the earth to be in this condition in Romans chapter 8, where it says it's groaning. And what happened in Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 is the reason why one day God is going to destroy the earth. That's the reason why a new heaven and a new earth will be made. Because that is the reason why the Lord is coming again. That is the reason why the earth is the way it is today. That's the reason why there was even a climate change conference and all sorts of foolish men gathering and talking foolish things because of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. The day sin entered into the world and the world was affected look at genesis 1 for instance verse 31 god this was before sin came into the world god saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good now that was the state of the earth but yet, look at Genesis 3, verse 17 and 18. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And yet, in Romans... It's telling us, and I'm going to read the verse again for you, Romans 8.22. We know that the whole creation groans and labours with birth pangs until now. And then he goes on in verse 23 to talk about the redemption. Why do you think... That some of you can say, when I was a lad, I could run here, I could run there, I could do this, I could do that, but now I can no longer do what I used to. Because the body is groaning. It's travailing in pain, waiting for a day when we shall get a glorified body and we meet the Lord and changed in the twinkling of an eye. But you know, friends, in this earth, because of sin, the earth has gone from good to worse. When sin came into the world, something happened. And remember, we're 6,000 years on now from when the world was created. And the strange thing is this, that all this doesn't work with the evolutionist theology. 
because they tell us things like we went from a pool of jelly to something like a tadpole to something like a creature that crawled upon the land to something of an ape to something of a man and we got better and better as time went on they call it the survival of the fittest that we get better as time goes on but friends the bible tells us we don't we get worse as time goes on sin the longer it's there degrades us it words on words on us it we travel and the whole of creation we all groan under the curse of sin and so there is a problem with the earth there's no doubt about it but it's a sin problem that's the problem with the earth romans chapter 5 and verse 12 Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all men sinned. Sin entered into the world, but you know, friends, the ground became cursed because sin entered into the fields, it entered into the soils, it entered into the very fabric of the earth as well. And because by one man, sin entered into the world. Look at Romans 5, verse 12. Nevertheless, uh, Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as one through one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and death spread to all men, because all men sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who is to come. Friends, I want to say, the only thing that will ever change our earth and man's heart is when we look for him who's coming, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when the earth will change, but we must move on. Climate change. Now, you might say, has the climate changed before? Yes, it has. Many times. Look at the flood. Before the flood, there was no rain on the earth. Men lived for hundreds of years, and yet God changed the climate. And we had the flood. They'd never seen rain upon the earth. The dew of the ground used to just water the earth. But after the flood, the, uh, sorry, when the flood came, the climate changed. And friends, we, we read after the flood, men didn't live as long. And that was a repercussion of the flood. What about in the 10 plagues? The Lord moved and there was climate change. And, you know, friends, God brought judgment on the earth for sin. I'll tell you what, friends, if the politicians are panicking by now, they'll certainly have to something to panic about before the Lord comes again, because there's going to be huge changes in the climate just prior to the return of Jesus Christ. Matthew 12 deals with sorry matthew 24 deals with the lord's return doesn't it and uh let's have a look at verse 29 it says immediately after the tribulation of those days the sun will be darkened the moon will not give its light the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken <laughs> that's climate change <laughs> But what is it warning of in verse 30, 30 and 31? Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other folks they can have as many conferences as they like 
but nothing will happen to this earth until the Lord says. And friends, when it does, it'll be prior to his return. I'm not time to go into all the details of these verses, but let's just have a look at some verses, shall we? Revelation chapter 8, verse 5. The angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. And then in verse 7, the first angel sounded with hail and fire followed, mingled with blood. And they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the trees were burned up. And all the green grass burned up. My word. And then let's have a look at verse 9, verse 8 and 9. Second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. My word. Look at verses 10 and 11. Then a third angel sounded and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Verse 12, then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. Look at uh, chapter 9, verse 3. Then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, nor any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of the scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. And he goes on there. They had tails like scorpions. There were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men for five months. And they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon. But in Greek, he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past, behold, still two moles, woes are coming with these things. Verse 15, so the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month of the year were released to kill a third of mankind. My word. Verse 18, by these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths, and there's more. You see, friends, but all this is due to the sin problem on the earth. And those atrocities that God speaks of prior to the coming of the Lord, they are things that have been caused by sin. And we've got to realize that. But let's come to the stewardship of the earth, because this is important. Because I want you to be no doubt whatsoever that even as Christians, we still have a duty to the earth 
and to creation all around us. We know that climate change happens. It's been happening for years. But friends, there's nothing wrong with sustainable farming. Nothing wrong with planting a few more trees. And, you know, as Christians, we do have a duty to steward, be, to look after God's creation. Because when we come to Genesis 1, we find that human beings are made in the image of God. And knowing that our God has created all things, and knowing that our God sustains all things, and knowing that our God is going to deal with the sin problem on the earth, we as believers still have a duty to be good stewards of the earth, to look after the earth, whatever form that takes, whether it be helping farmers to look after their fields, or whether there be simple things like recycling. I mean, it baffles me. They talk about recycling as though it's something new. Friends, it's not. For donkey's years, people have been putting the milk bottles out in a, <laughs> for the milkman to take. What did he do with them? They refilled them. <laughs> when I was a little lad, the fizzy pot man came round every Thursday on his lorry. And my mum, if she could afford it that week, would buy a bottle of dandelion and burdock and a bottle of Tizer for me and my sister to have a, you know, a good drink of. But friends, the next time the pot man was due, my mother would have had to wash all the bottles to take them back to the pot man so they could be reused for another occasion. So all this recycling lot, there's nothing new about it at all. We've been doing it for donkey's years. But friends, it baffles me when I, we hear these people talking about recycling as though they've just discovered it. But here in Genesis 1, verse 28, look what God tells Adam. This is very important. Because God blessed them when he created the earth. And God said, be fruitful and multiply. And then he said this, fill the earth and subdue it, having dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That word, subdue, means to tread or to conquer. In other words, man is given a responsibility to be good stewards of the earth, to look after it to subdue it, to have dominion. You know, friends, we live in a messed up society. And, you know, we have a lot of people talking a load of sweet nothings when it comes to the environment. In fact, we have a society that has more care for animals and the environment than they do for people. And for life. Because the same people who will block roads and glue themselves to the roads and give themselves to motorways and cry out about the environment and about the earth, the same people with the same liberal agenda are pro-abortion for murders of children. They are pro-euthanasia and they have an agenda to murder the elderly. And friends, I tell you, human life means nothing to them. But you know, man is precious in the sight of God. Man is made in the image of God, and he's been placed here to subdue and to have dominion and be a good steward of the earth. You know, way back in 2015, a dentist had to shoot a lion. I think they called it Cecil the Lion. And then there was a story about a gorilla as a child fell into its enclosure. I think it was in 2016. And because the gorilla was going to grab the child, the zookeeper shot the gorilla. 
But you know, friends, there was an outcry because the animal was dead. And those very people went as far as to say, well, it was the child's fault and the child should have suffered the consequences. Friends, I'm telling you the truth. These are actual things that happened. We've got a messed up society. You see, friends, God's order is being reversed. And animals and the environment and all the rest means more than people that were made in the image of God. But nevertheless, we have a duty as God's people to be good stewards of the earth. That's the way God's intents. But friends, in this study, we looked at the origin of the earth, the sustaining of the earth, the sin problem of the earth, that it's decaying and getting worse, that we are to be good stewards of the earth to the best of our ability, for it is God's creation. But number five, the destruction of the earth. Because way back in Genesis chapter eight, when God gave that promise that while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. Notice it says, while the earth remains. Friends, right from the beginning of scripture, Sin had entered the world. It was never God's intention that the earth would remain forever. While the earth remains. It's a promise with a clause. Because as long as the earth is, exists, as long as it remains, it will have seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. But that key word is remaineth. And that indicates from the earliest days of scripture, that this earth will not always be, while the earth remaineth. Come with me to 2 Peter chapter 3, because we find ultimately at the Lord's appointed time, when he comes, the earth will be no more. Second book of Peter, chapter 3. Let's look at verse 7, first of all. We'll read from verse 5. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water, but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. That's very important. The heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now look at verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth's work, the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt. So the word of God tells us that at the return of Christ to the earth itself, in his own appointed time, this earth, one day we know it will disappear and the heavens will be destroyed and the, the, the earth will be burned up. Verse 11, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. 
and he's challenging us in that 11th verse of how we are to live in the light of the Lord's coming. One thing that the climate change fanatics have is that this world will not always be. But friends, it's not carbon emissions and some of these other things that will destroy the world. Let me tell you, God's going to destroy it because it's cursed with sin. But Revelation chapter 21 tells us, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Friends, the Lord is going to replace it. And he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And it's going to be just like the one he created in the first place prior to man spoiling it with sin. Friends, this old world is full of death and decay, tears, loved ones dying, animals dying. In the autumn, the leaves will be dying. Everything around us is full of death because the earth is cursed because of sin on the earth. But thank God, God is going to give a new heaven. Now, look, whatever millennial view people may have, and over the thousand years, and friends, one thing we all agree on is that Christ is coming again. And in God's appointed time, the old earth will be destroyed, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And what a wonderful thing that is to look forward to. So, friends, to conclude, I've no doubt when we look at climate change that the whole creation is groaning and traveller in pain till now. But when you have politicians talking about pledging to save the earth, what are they doing? They're taking the cre creator out of view. That's the thing, they're taking God out of the view and they're putting themselves as gods and saying we will, must save the planet. No, friends, God made the earth. God will sustain the earth. God will deal with the same problem on the earth. God does require that we be good stewards of the earth, but nonetheless... God's going to destroy it himself one day and bring a new heaven and a new earth. So when you hear of climate change, I'd urge you just to remind yourself that Jesus is coming soon. So don't fret. Don't be stopping up late at night. You know, when you get three days hot sun and they tell you, oh, there's warming up and it's going to... Friends... Some of you are older than me. You had hotter summers <laughs> way back then. They just didn't keep records of the temperatures in those days. But friends, I tell you, because you get three days hot sun, we don't need to panic. In fact, God sent it for three days hot sun. And I'll tell you something else. He's sending more rain this week. Friends, Let's look to the Lord. Let's just, well, I don't know what time it is. Oh, dear. Can we sing one verse of how great thou art? Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand have made. I see the stars. I hear the mighty thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to thee how great they are. And then I'll ask Andrew to bring us